trick. What am I now? Uh, stupid? No, I'm Deanery. What's the difference? <laughs> You're going to Brazil! The plug-and-play era was weird. You see, my first home console wouldn't be until around 2015 when I saved up enough money to buy my very own Wii U. Cry with me now. As a kid, the Wii U was perfectly fine. It had the newest Mario Kart, Smash Brothers, so it fit the bill. Before that, I was stuck playing what any kid growing up in the early to mid-2000s fondly remembers, the takeover of cheap electronics. Plug-and-plays were an inexpensive alternative to traditional home consoles, and I own quite a few of these. I don't know who or how these appeared in my Prank house one day, but I played these a ton as a kid. These things were my first introduction to video games, and to this day, I still check to ensure they aren't tragically killed through battery acid. So while that might seem a little odd and strange, someone at Danerade HQ was unintentionally playing the long-term game and now can profit off his micromanagement habits by making a video about plug-and-play consoles. And since you guys liked the border so much last time... Soft, chubby, fat-looking children. Super Mario! Now, the main appeal in these systems lie in the associated licenses. Did you actually think major companies would invest in exclusive game development to reap the rewards of the plug-and-play market? Exactly. Instead, they fell into one of two camps. Emulators or nose. This was the plug and play I played the most as a kid. Pac-Man is just perfect for these types of things. Plug and plays by nature don't warrant being played for very long, and Pac-Man's arcade-like nature made it perfect to uh plug and play. I own this one as a kid, which I rarely ever see online. This isn't like a rare plug and play by any means. Most of these things hold little value today. But when googling Pac-Man plug and plays, this is not the most common one that gets pulled up. This one was a solid collection of eight games. You got Pac-Man and its sequels, alongside some Nanco classics, Dig Dug and Galaxian for example, which it was a huge shame we didn't get Galaga. An all-around solid package, though what is scummy and not super enjoyable when researching these things is that they periodically mixed and matched games. Take this Super Pac-Man inspired plug and play with four fewer games. Looking at the copyright dates, it's clear that throughout time Jack Specific would just take the work they had and add it on top of it. Throw in a couple of new games games in a new shell and boom, new plug and play. Now are these plug and plays that well made? What do you think? The thing is that these things weren't meant to be played through an HD display. I'm actually playing these through HDMI output, and yet before you say it, wow, Dana Raid is cheap. He's using one of those crappy composite video to HDMI converters from Amazon. Um, excuse me, have you seen some of the better upscalers? No thank you, the new Splatoon Joy-Cons look a lot more appealing, thank you very much. Plus, these plug and plays were made cheaply, so either way, the pixels will look washed out and fuzzy no matter what. So while this is the best possible way it'll look for digital media, the artifacts and fuzzier image are hidden much better on the older TVs of the 2000s. The plug and play fiasco spread to multiple companies and their properties, but a huge proponent of them was Nickelodeon. They had a range of popular IPs like Spongebob, The Fairly Odd Parents, Danny Phantom, The Works. Nick was quick to slap their IPs on cheap plastic to give it the old plug and play treatment because like... It's Nick. I've got two Nicktoons ones, and the first one we'll look at is very basic looking. There is a Fairly Odd Parents game based on Channel Chasers, which is awesome. I love Channel Chasers and nothing that came afterwards. Get out of here, please. Chloe, more like death. So this game is kind of like Pac-Man. It's fine. There's a Jimmy Neutron game that is kind of like Donkey Kong. It's fine. There's a SpongeBob game that is kind of like Mario Party. It's fine. There's another SpongeBob game that is kind of like if Nirvana was served on a plate. In this one, you have to feed the hungry customers at Bikini Bottom by uh, shooting Krabby Patties at them. They all seem to enjoy it except this guy who isn't having it. The other Nicktoons plug and play has a camping theme, which can be seen on the device's outer shell. I always liked when they got artsy with how these plug and plays looked. This, like many others, is a simple minigame collection featuring all of your favorite Nicktoons characters. I actually like this one quite a bit, and it might be the best from a production value standpoint. The art within the game looks the cleanest, and it seems as though they drew things aware of the limitations and output quality of plug and plays. Things just look less ugly, in my opinion. The games are also pretty fun, except what's going on here? However, none of this stands in comparison to the greatest plug and play ever to be crafted by. By God.
It's a nose. The SpongeBob plug and play was one of God's greatest inventions and for good reason. It was both functional and stylish. The plug and play uses SpongeBob's nose as part of the controller design. How awesome is that? So as the title of the video suggests, this plug and play is kind of hard, or at least I thought so at the time. This game has a whopping four SpongeBob themed games. That's a lot of SpongeBob action, me boy. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I say it like that? The first game to look at is Sponge Pop, which is essentially a breakout clone. Despite that, this was probably my favorite game in the package. I think it's because of how many fun elements they throw in there. Popping Bubbles has a chance to drop a power up, which makes the gameplay way more refreshing. Some make the ball bigger, make the ball slower. Some give SpongeBob a wider range to bounce the ball, i.e. the absorption look, which saying that out loud makes it sound really weird. I mean, what else do you want me to call this face? The oak crap, I'm not subscribed and haven't turned on notifications to famous YouTuber Dana Raid look. Though I will say, while it's not particularly hard to keep the ball in play, as a small baby, I can vividly remember losing quite a bit and therefore going, oh no, 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 no. We got Snowball Showdown next, which I'm pretty sure is based on that one SpongeBob episode where they bully Nintendo for delivering a mediocre direct. <laughs> Exposed. In this game, you have to throw snowballs at Patrick, but it's one of those games where you have a meter that determines the strength of your throw. This one is fine and can even be played with a friend if you have one of those. Though I always thought, even as a kid, the controls were just way too strict, whether it be aiming with the arrow or even the strength of your throw. I swear, sometimes if I'm just a little bit over what I want, SpongeBob will lob a snowball at 100 miles per hour. Also, when winning a level, SpongeBob does a little cult like dance, which I must admit, if you try doing it yourself, it's kind of weird and uncomfortable and cringe. Okay, so Guide and Collide is next, and this one is a puzzle game. A boring puzzle game. In this one, you have to guide jellyfish to SpongeBob so he can catch them, and uh... I don't know where he puts it. Wasn't the whole thing in the show that SpongeBob catches it for fun and then releases it right afterwards? Don't tell me you're trying to hide something from me, are you? SpongeBob! Anyways, so this one is just a little slow in execution. You have to place these fan things to guide the jellyfish and then patiently wait for the jellyfish to get to SpongeBob. A, in some levels, this can be a prolonged process where you aimlessly watch the screen and B, that is assuming you did the puzzle correctly because if not, you'll have to do it all over again and wait all over again for the jellyfish to get to SpongeBob. Also, there is a time limit, which is a little weird because if you were struggling to think of the correct combination, the pause button works just fine. Also, once again, this game employs the strange SpongeBob dance. Imagine asking out a girl to homecoming and she says yes and this is your first reaction. I'd probably dump you on the spot. Now the final game we'll be looking at is Jellyfish Dodge, which <laughs> Whoa! Playing this game as a tiny baby was tough as nails. Being able to beat this game separates the men from the boys. This is a survival type game where you'll have to complete a handful of objectives to win each level. This could be getting to the trap door, surviving for a certain amount of time, collecting the golden jellyfish, etc. The thing with this game though is the level design. It starts pretty standard, but just you wait, it'll get harder as we progress. There are multiple types of jellyfish to thwart your progress. The classic pink jellyfish are pretty harmless and usually just move in a predictable pattern. The blue jellyfish have a mini spasm attack every once in a while, sending shock waves. The green jellyfish are similar to the pink jellyfish, except they leave a shock trail behind them. The red jellyfish have consumed three Starbucks frappuccinos and fly around the map frantically. So while some of these jellyfish may not seem so bad, combined, the threat they pose can become a challenge. The game is split up into four worlds, which makes this the lengthiest game of the package. The first world is set in jellyfish fields. It doesn't have too much going on. They are pretty generous with the number of hits or stings you can take. The water droplets above indicate how many stings you can muster before uh-oh! That's something I haven't really called particular attention to yet. This plug and play has quite a bit of charm. It's how they construct the games to feel like the world of SpongeBob. Whether it's through the aforementioned live system and general look of Jellyfish Dodge, or the power-ups and backgrounds of Sponge Pop. It's extremely fun. World 2 is set in Bikini Bottom, where things get a little spicy. We got some more obstacles to act as obstacles in our path. There's this level where the game decides to send an onslaught of the red jellyfish variant. Later, in level 13, they got a whole cult of jellyfish just flying around in a circle. Like, what am I supposed to do? 
I did it. The next level has jellyfish baby guarding the golden jellyfish we need to collect, and I swear it's a lot harder than it looks. World 3 is set in Goo Lagoon, which... <laughs> <laughs> Some of these levels are pretty tough, let me tell you that. If high schooler Danarade is struggling, I can only imagine what baby Danarade was thinking when playing these levels. Level 8 has a frantic chase to catch 16 golden jellyfish, and boy are they fast. When I failed, we get to see this game's weird Spongebob related animation in this level. I'm not even going to try. Level 12 is where things really get spicy because oh ho ho ho! I'll also draw your attention to the slowly decreasing stings you are allowed to endure. Wow, this is hard! I mean, look at this tiptoeing I'm doing. I feel like I'm on thin ice walking between these things. Level 14 is like if you took a level 12 and dipped it in screw you juice. Not only do you have to collect the golden jellyfish in the middle, but you also have to get back out. How is a stupid baby Danrite supposed to figure this stuff out. Also, thanks game for giving me one sting before I bite the dust. Really nice of you there. We have one more world to go over, the Krusty Krab. Yay! I don't know how much more I can endure this. I will say, it's kind of nice seeing the visual switch up from the inside of the Krusty Krab to the roof, I think. These levels aren't as hard as you might think, or at least immediately. That is, until level 10 when, yep, uh-huh, that's the Spongebob plug and play I know. Again, it has to do with the fact that if you were using a regular old controller, most of these challenges wouldn't be an issue. But the finicky tactile feeling of the nose causes specific movements to feel stiff and lead you to, you know, whatever this is. Yeah, see, then level 14 comes around and I gotta whack 20 jellyfish, which doesn't sound that bad, but when they're going 60 miles an hour on top of coming from every direction under the sun, this one is pretty hard. I did it. But then, the ultimate final level brings us a dramatic boss fight against just an overly big pink jellyfish. This climactic boss fight consists of aimlessly running around until time runs out. That was so hard! Alright, that was Jellyfish Dodge, which therefore means that was the iconic Spongebob plug and play. Does it surprise me that some of these games maybe weren't as hard as I remember them as a small child? No, but that doesn't take away from the fact that these things have a certain charm to them. They were cheap novelties, but as someone who never really grew up with home consoles till much later, these were in a way my first proper introduction to video games. And for that, they were harmless experiences that shaped my life. I can give them my highest honor of making a video about them. Oh gee whiz, what an honor I hear you saying.